This is Richard Lee from the Hall Institute of Public Policy, and welcome to the Hall Institute Public Forum. This is part of our ongoing series on New Jersey's media landscape. We're taking a look at where the journalism industry is today, how we got there, and how we're going. And I'm, I'm pleased to have with me someone who's very involved with the state of journalism today, and that's um, Daryl Isherwood, the editor of Politicker NJ. Daryl, thanks for joining sure, us. Sure, thanks for having me. And, you know, we do have some big topics we want to talk about, some general things, but as Timing has it, you're here just as some major news is breaking in New Jersey. The New Jersey Supreme Court this morning issued a, a long-awaited ruling in a school funding you know, decision, which is going to have a significant impact immediately, probably on the budget process and, and beyond that. I wonder if you can just briefly tell us what the court has done. Yeah, and I haven't actually read the decision yet, but they basically said they have to fully fund the school formula, um, which was not fully funded in the current budget. What I got on my way down reading the uh, alerts was that it, it's an additional 500 million that's required, I think, for next year. So um, it creates a little bit of havoc with the budget process because obviously you have to find 500 million dollars. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you know, this, you know we, there was some news that you know revenue was income tax revenue was coming in faster than anticipated, and I think people already had it spent before yeah. um, this yeah. money's in. So yeah, we have until June 30th to balance the budget. Mm -hmm. Lots going to happen. I know. You know, the governor is going to be speaking later. He has kind of hinted that he might consider ignoring the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, I guess, you know, he'll certainly be asked about that. Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. So it uh, be interesting to, to follow, and I'm sure we'll be following it on Politicker mm -hmm. and some other places. So let me um, back up a bit. I I'm one of the many people here in Trenton who visit your site religiously mm -hmm. several times a day because it's Good. valuable to keep up on what's happening. But for people who are watching who are not familiar with politics, can you, can you just... Talk a little bit about what the site is and what you do. Sure. Um, Politicker NJ is, is an insider site um, for all the political happenings, not just in Trenton, but in New Jersey. And we cover, you know, sort of the inside gossip, insider news of politics, and then also elections. Uh, you know, we're gearing up for the primary election right. next week or in two weeks now. Um, and that's sort of our focus is anything politically that happens uh, in the state of New Jersey we're on and we do some analysis, uh, breaking news, that kind of thing. The so site's been around about 10 years, um, started out as Politics NJ and then was, uh, the name was changed a couple of years back when we were taken over by the New York Observer. So now we're Politicker NJ. And you've been the editor about a year? Uh, about a year, uh -huh. yep, I took over last year. What was it like stepping into, um, to edit a publication that already had this, you know, pretty strong mm -hmm. reputation? And you know, big shoes to fill. Yeah, it was strange. Um, the, the history of the site is it was developed by a, a guy who went by a pseudonym right. of Wally Edge. And uh, for years he wrote anonymously under that pseudonym and, and there was always big speculation as to who it was. And you know, what, there was a sort of a parlor game in Trenton to figure out who Wally Edge was. And about a year ago, he got in touch with me and said, hey, I'm leaving. Um, are you interested in, in taking over the site? So I, we, we hashed it out a little bit, and I said, sure, I'd love to come in and do it, but with an idea that it would change from what it was to, to a, you know, sort of a different format. Um, one thing I didn't really expect was, you know, changing over from this anonymous, you know, he made a lot of enemies over yeah. his 10 years. Uh, As uh, somewhat reported. easier when you are anonymous. Exactly. Now people know yeah, who you exactly. are. Exactly. And so there was more, uh, let's call it baggage associated with the site than I expected coming in. Um, and there were also a number of people who were, for lack of a better word, friends of the site. Um, you know, had been sources for Wally Edge over the years, and, and so a lot of those people sort of expected their relationship to continue as un, unscathed, let's say. And, uh, and you know, there are people I didn't know or had no relationship with. I have sources of my own, so obviously that changed. And that didn't sit well with some people when I started. So there were challenges I did not expect when I came in to... Uh, so. Well, I'm sure, you know, if you enjoy politics like I do and you do, it, it's a lot of fun following, yeah. but it's also got to be a lot of work. And I wanted to get a sense of what that's like. I covered the State House back in, you know, I guess the late 1980s. I knew what it was like then. Um, we had a show a couple of weeks ago with some people who actually covered it way before then. And, and I'm sure there's some constants throughout the years, but also a lot of change. And um, I, I know you're not limited to covering the New Jersey State House, but a lot of your coverage mm -hmm. takes place there. Uh, what is it like covering state government in New Jersey today? It's interesting. We, we talk a lot about um, the partisanship and the, uh, the gamesmanship, and that's what we kind of specialize with, so specialize in. So it's, uh, 
there it's fun um it's it's definitely a you know it's a big stage and it's there's a lot of as i said there's a lot of gamesmanship and, and each side trying to get in, gain an edge but you're also dealing with you know let's say 120 legislators governor and his staff and all of those people tend to have agendas and egos. Um, so as you know from covering the state house, you, you run into that a lot. And if you work on the staffs, you're even more aware yeah, of that exactly. Sort of stuff. Exactly. That's right. So you've got all the legislators and then each person's got their own staff and then you've got the partisan offices and everybody's got their agenda and everybody's got their own opinions on how things should be, how things should be written. Um, so you get a lot of pushback on stories if it's not uh, written to somebody's uh, you know, up to somebody's, to what they expected, right. you know, somebody's expectations. You tend to hear a lot from them. And, uh, you know, and, and, and to my, I, I think part of that, that's what makes it fun and to some extent. It's a little old getting yelled at, but that, that makes it fun, as you remember. You know, you, know, you had an impact. Yeah, 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 exactly. So your, your background is, is in print. And talk about the speed with which stuff gets out to people today. I know on your site and some others, we have a number of Internet news sites mm -hmm. today. Almost as soon as something is happening, it's up there on yeah. the web. It's funny, with this Supreme Court decision, we, were, we had a long discussion about where we were going to fit in on the coverage. Um, and I guess my decision with this was, I want everybody who comes to Politic or NJ during the day, you know, all of our regular readers, I want them to find out about this decision from us first. That was my goal. And so we were up this morning at 10.01. The decision came out at 10. We had our, our, our uh, headline and our lead up at 10.01. And to me, that's a victory. You know, we get that up fast, we get an alert out, and all of the people who, you know, our loyal readership, let's say, can read about it first on our site. Now, later on, some of the bigger papers, the Star Ledger, they're gonna have a number of reporters working on it. They're gonna do a phenomenal job of taking it apart. And we probably can't compete on that level from staffing standpoint, we just don't have it. But I feel good that we were up immediately, almost real time on the decision, and we got an alert out, so people got it at 10.01, bang, on their Blackberries, you know, the Supreme Court decision happened. So. Is there a downside to all that speed with maybe stuff not getting into context? Like sometimes I've seen, maybe on Politicker or some of the other you know, daily papers who have reporters who, who are on Twitter, mm -hmm. will go to a meeting and you'll see, you know, almost minute by minute, it's yeah. almost like a play-by-play -play baseball thing. The governor asked, answered this question, this person right. asked that, which is nice. It's almost like being there, but is there a, a negative to Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yeah, you, it, it gets, the way it's been, and, and I, I notice it too when I'm yeah. following our coverage when we have reporters somewhere, it gets hard to create a big picture because you've got all of these details, but you don't have an overview of whatever's happening. And so you've particularly with those twitter feeds yeah. but but also with the coverage kind of coverage we'll do which is a couple of sentences a paragraph a couple of paragraphs it gets hard to put all that together and get some kind of idea of what what the big picture is um, and so we've we've actually heard that complaint that we're we have a a new site that you and i have right. talked about state street, state street wire yeah. which is uh it's sort of a legislative wire service so that's all about getting it up there fast and and almost real time and that's one of the complaints I've heard is, you know, I get so much information, which is great, but I have no, no way to piece it all together. Yeah. So I would say that's definitely a negative. Yeah. I want to talk maybe in broader terms just about the journalism industry and maybe State Street Wire is a nice segue into that. Now, you and I have talked when you were good enough to come to the class at Teacher mm -hmm. Rutgers about, um, you know, State Street Wire is a premium service that people have to pay for. And I think you talked to the class right around the same time as the New York Times was right, yeah. going to um, a paywall. Um, how is that working out for you? And where do you see that in terms of the industry? Do you mm -hmm. think it's going to you know, work and become a model for other places? So far for us, we're, we're in good shape. It's going well. Um, it's, a, it's a very specialized type of coverage and a very specialized audience. And it's so there is an audience out there. Um, lobbyists, trade groups, attorneys, you know, anybody who's interested in what's happening over there, you know, we call it in the weeds of what's happening over there. Um, so for us right now, we're, you know, we're getting there. We're, we're, yeah. we're where we'd like to be. You know, we're building up subscription, subscription base. And, uh, and the good news for that site is we don't need, we're not looking for 30,000 subscriptions to survive. You know, it's just, it's not, there's just not that audience and we're not, we're not looking for that. 
I think that it, sites like that have a place. Um, you see them also with specialized newsletters and things like right. that. Right, or the um, Wall Street Journal, I guess, is one model. They've been able to do it because of their financial yeah, content. Yeah, exactly, for their financial content. When you've got news that somebody needs to do their job, I think that's when it works. And the New York Times probably can get away with it because they're the New York Times. Right. Um, I don't know that you'll see some of the smaller papers um, even the mid-size, you know, regional papers able to get away with it because I don't think there's that much, there's so much free content out there right. that I don't see for a general news site people paying the money to, to, to view it because yeah. their attitude is, and we've heard it on our site, their attitude is going to be, I can get it elsewhere, so why am I going to pay you for it? Um, and we actually heard one of the people we were talking to about a subscription said, I won't pay for news on principle. So yeah. there's that attitude out there, for better or worse. Yeah, no yeah well, we're, certain, we're really, I believe, at a, a pivotal juncture in the journalism industry. I'd be interested you know, to get your thoughts. I mean, I think the immediate picture that a lot of people see is you know, the industry is dying, and maybe that's focused more on print, but you see what's happening economically, the different ways people get information now, being able to get it at no cost. But I've always contended it's a matter if you see it as a glass half empty, half full. I mean, as, Consumers, as we were talking about, you get news faster than you ever got before, more conveniently and, and more specialized. So um, starting to see some new models develop mm -hmm. that are catching on. Um, I don't think any of us know what the model is, right. if there is right. one. But you know, what's your assessment on the journalism? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic to an extent. I, you know, when you talk to, I mean, you deal with it every day in your class. You yeah. talk to younger people and they don't, consume news the way we did or do. Um, and I don't know, and you probably would know better than I do, I don't know that they consume it to the degree that we do either. Um, I think it's a much more disjointed, you know, I don't know that there's that effort to grab a paper, pick it up, find out what's happening in the day so that, you know. Um, so I, I'm a little pessimistic from that point of view, that I don't know that the people, I, you know, younger than us are yeah. reading it to the to the degree yeah. but on the other hand you've got a lot of um a lot of new models out there a lot of people trying to yeah. figure out what's next and to your point before i don't i don't know that there is a model i think there's going to be several right different yeah I, ways. I would agree with yeah. you yeah. it's because nobody has yet figured out how to make money on the internet yeah. fully you know, I mean, we're trying it, but ours wouldn't work for a general site. Right. And, you know, the, the Star Ledger has NJ.com and they're going from an advers advertising standpoint. I'm sure there's some money to be made there, but I don't know that there's enough to sustain the Star Ledger in its current yeah. form just on the Internet. Yeah, yeah. People have figured out how to draw a lot of readers to your site. Mm -hmm. But I think like, the next step turning that into to money right. is, you know, right. it hasn't been completely figured out. Mm -hmm. um, your sense of, you know, with the changes that have taken place, and I kind of put them into two categories, you know, one, you know, the downturn, the cutback, so there's less journalists out mm -hmm. there, and, and on the other hand, new ways, new sites, new mm -hmm. ways to get information. Do you think, you know, today's citizens are, you know, better or less informed about, you know, government and politics today? I would say probably less informed. Um... But, but having said that, there is also more platforms for them to get their news. Um, it's, I just had a discussion with a friend of mine who, who happens to work on Wall Street, and he got his political news of the day. He found out about the Supreme, Supreme Court decision on Bloomberg. Now, for instance, when the gentleman you had, in, uh, Harvey and, and Dan, were, and, and even you, were working on Press Row at the State House, Bloomberg didn't exist. Right. You know, that, wasn't a, that wasn't a model. And he, I talked to him at about 10 minutes after 10, and he had it that came across Bloomberg. So from that standpoint, with so many more platforms for it, you know, I, I think there's a greater, uh, people get political, you know, straight political news from different and newer sources. And so I think from that standpoint, maybe they're a little better informed on some of the larger decisions. Yeah, because you, you might not, if you subscribe to Bloomberg, you might not have seen that you know, before. You, know, right. you might have just seen business stories right. or whatever. Right. And, and I know, you know occasionally like, I'll see stories like on Facebook or Twitter for the first time. It yeah. just happens to be where you are on the internet, who's posting yeah. what. So. The thing with Bloomberg too, and, and just other, other sites is they've sort of discovered, I worked for a business, uh, business news site before coming here. 
one of the things we, we, we set out to do was explain the relationship between money and politics, because it's important. Yeah. That's a huge piece of that puzzle that's different than straight traditional business reporting. Right. Yeah. And it's, it, it, you know, especially these days when everything is so partisan and right. so, you know, that, that makes a big difference. Yeah, kind of leads into the next question, which, you know, again, talking about what's taking place in the industry, um, do you think government is being held more accountable, less accountable? Right? I think in the big picture, probably less accountable. Yeah. There are fewer reporters right. Right. Um, than there were. And, you know, sites like mine, while we're there and we're reporting breaking news and, you know, between the two sites, we're posting 25 stories a day, probably on just politics and government. But they're not as in-depth as you would have found in, let's say, the Star-Ledger 15 years ago, or even today. I mean, this, you know, the Star-Ledger still does some good in-depth yeah, stuff. Well, in fact, they had a, a really big story on Elizabeth Board of Education, yeah. but how often I think that reporter was able to spend a couple of months yeah. on it. You yeah. know, that's a luxury today. Yeah, exactly. And he spent, I think it said, three or four months, yeah. and you won't find that too often that a right. reporter's given the time to do that and, you know, is able to squeeze that in with, Feeding the beast is what yeah. we, you know, the, the, the daily uh, output of copy. So. Yeah, yeah, I remember a couple of times I was given time to work on investigations, but it was much shorter time, and right. it just felt really strange not to have to turn out a story yeah. or two a day. So. You almost feel like you're not earning you're not your producing. money. Producing, yeah, right. you're not uh, earning your keep. Yeah. So, but I think you know, to that extent, it's there's a much less, you know, we we post a broad range of stories, but very few are actually in-depth stories. And that's, you know, that's, that's an issue. I mean, you'll get an overview of what's happening, but you're not going to get real down and dirty in the, yeah. you know, in the, in the muck, so to speak. But I think that's also the way people process information. They, they, they don't as much read longer stories, you know, that they look for shorter things. And like I've noticed that when, when I teach, sometimes I'll have films and if the film goes more than 15, 20 minutes, people start to, to zone out. Mm -hmm. But if you show them five minute YouTube video, they're tuned yeah. into that and they can react to it. And you know, that's the generation which is gonna be tomorrow's right. you know, audience. Right. So uh, I guess we'll all have to adjust to that. Yeah. Yeah. And you saw newspapers try for a while, shorter stories, you know, they put size limits and I guess they still do. Yeah. Part of that's just the restriction because of the, the, right. the news hole, but you've also, I think there was a recognition of that, that people aren't reading these, you know, opuses in the right. newspaper anymore. Yeah. So, uh, one of the things I've been looking at in, in my research here and at Rutgers is a process known as agenda setting, which um, goes back to study, I think sometime in the 70s, where, you know, some researchers determined that the stories that the press chose to report on, how much coverage they gave to certain issues, actually set the agenda for the public. That's what they're interested in. Um, they kind of took their cues from the media and then indirectly decision makers would too mm -hmm. if they saw you know a number of stories written about an issue and then the public finds out about it then it becomes mm -hmm. um, you know an issue for policymakers. Uh, I guess the two-part question one do you buy into that theory and you know who's setting the agenda today mm -hmm. is it still the press or you know because of all these changes um, does the public have a greater role the politicians have more influence than they had in the past? I think I do buy into that I think that you know, particularly some of the larger papers do set the agenda yeah. um, for what's quote unquote important, mm -hmm. uh, the story of the day and, and what, what stories they follow. Um, you know, I mean, you, you, uh, a good splashy story in the paper can definitely alter the thinking in the, yeah. you know, in the front office across the street or, or in Washington. Uh, in terms of who is setting the agenda, I think there is much I would say there's much less reliance on the press. You know, you notice the governor, he's got one today, he's got a town hall, he's done, I don't know what the number is now, yeah, 30, 40 of these yeah. things, where he just goes out and speaks directly to the public. Yeah. And it's virtually the same message, week in, week out, yeah. that he gives to the public. And they're fairly, I've been to a bunch of them, they're fairly well attended. Mm -hmm. um, you get a kind of cross-section of people, pro and con, you know, people that are in, in the Christie camp, so to speak, and not. Mm -hmm. um, so he's definitely getting his message out there and uh, without us, which right. from a press standpoint is a little bit disconcerting, you know, that that happens. But 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 to his credit, he's got a very slick operation in yeah. terms of getting his message out. Um, you know, that the press staff, they issue releases that are different than just announcing the news. Right. You know, they're they're Yeah, I've noticed they have an edge to them. Yeah, there's yeah. an edge to them. They're critical of the Democrats and they're, 
it's not just this happened today and here's the governor's quote on it. It's, you know, they're, they're almost attack pieces in some cases and all of that bypasses the media. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've always, you know, contended that that's one of the most significant changes of, you know, what's happened in the industry that, you know, whether you're a governor, or any kind of state official, you know, you don't have to rely on the press to come cover your press conference mm -hmm. to, you know, edit your, you know, write some of your press release. You can get your information right out to the public, sure. which mm -hmm. is great if you're one of those people. Uh, but on the other hand, for consumers, they're getting stuff without it going through the scrutiny of right. the media. You know, and one thing that a, that a site like mine doesn't provide that I always liked with a newspaper is I liked the, pl you know, the placement of a story. So yeah. I know at least somebody's view of what's the important right. story of the day. And, and I miss that with internet sites where you, get, you, you, know, you sign on and there's sort of a hodgepodge of stories and you're trying to figure out you know, what are they, what's the important story and then you know, what the other problem you have is finding specific stories when you go on a big site like say the Wall Street Journal and you know you're interested in a specific story and you get on there and there's 35 stories yeah. on the front page. And That's one if they have a good search function right, it helps out right. but not all sites do. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I'm interested particularly and I know this kind of predates your time at Politicker but I'm sure you, were, you know, followed the two, you know, the 09 governor's mm -hmm. race and the 05 pretty closely because um, in my research I'm, I'm focusing on some of the changes that take place in those elections. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of changes do you think you know, took place in terms of, of the media and its influence between the 05 election when it was Corzine mm -hmm. and, and Forrester and Christie and Corzine four years later? You know, I think particularly in the Christie-Corzine race, um, I think the media played a role, but one of the enduring themes in that race was Christie's lack of specificity on his policies, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, and he wasn't forced to, to be specific yeah. and there he is, he won, right. you know, and I don't know how that would have played 10, 15, 20 years ago, but I imagine they would have hit him harder yeah. and there would have been more people to hit him harder on, you know, what do you plan to do? Yeah. And that, that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, and he was able to, he ran a phenomenal campaign. Right. I mean, he, he did what he, what he needed to do, obviously, because he won, um, and he never did outline. Here's what I plan yeah. to do when I get there, uh, at least in, in any you know specific uh, terms. So I think that's a big change, um, yeah. you know, in the level of coverage. Uh, just fewer reporters it lends itself to that because you've got reporters who are pressed to just get a story in, as opposed to sitting down and kind of going through the real in-depth stories, they're reporting the surface stuff. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a big change. Mm -hmm. What about the influence of new media, even sites like Politicker, which, you know, you know, there's a lot of new internet sites, but you're one of the ones, you know, you were around in 05 mm -hmm. and 09, even though you personally weren't. You know, I think we, we've played a role in, in changing the way news is reported as well, um, for better or worse. You know, we, we're about the horse race, yeah. and uh, proudly so, you know, and, and that's, there are a lot of people out there, media analysts and political analysts, who say that's everything wrong with political coverage these days, right. is it's all about the horse race. And, uh, but it's also what people are interested yeah, in. Exactly, and it's, you know, we, again, proudly report on the polls, the money, who's up, who's down. Uh, you know, we get into policy stuff to an extent, but our bread and butter is the horse race, yeah. and that's, I think that has changed to some extent, yeah. that that's more the focus. Um, and I don't know if it's, we survived because of that or we helped usher that in, sites like mine, but that's definitely, uh, you know, definitely a change. And, and you see, I mean, how many polling institutes are there out there yeah. now? And how many polls get, I think there are three up today. Um, yeah. on, on and around election issues. time, I'm always hearing about polls, institutes yeah. I never heard of, and all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. And the majority of those are, you know, who's up, who's down. There's yeah. not generally not polling specific, I guess they sp poll specific yeah. policies and topics sometimes, but a lot of it's, uh, do you, you know, uh, do you think they're doing a good job or not? Yeah. You know, and, so that all lends itself to a, a horse race type of coverage as well. Okay, uh, the last topic I just wanted to broach for you is like where you see New Jersey fitting in into the media picture nationwide. I, I have this theory that, you know, I think because we're 
the most densely populated state in the nation. A lot of things, public policy issues emerge here first, mm -hmm. and then we're also the first to respond to them. And there's been some environmental things that I can cite, but you know, sometimes I, I think the same may hold true for the media. You know, mm -hmm. the you know issues that you know change the media landscape. You know, really hit New mm -hmm. Jersey hard. May have hit us a little sooner, perhaps because we were a print-heavy state. Uh, but I'm also seeing signs that you know people are trying different models. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know where do you see us fitting in nationwide. I think where I think this is a hugely competitive media environment, yeah. um, both because of the proximity to New York, but just right. because this is you know New Jersey uh, is a as you said the most densely populated state. Uh, a lot of the people that live here work in New York, so it's a yeah. it's a hugely competitive media environment. So I think we are to an extent on the cutting edge of what's what happens. Um, and it's, you know, for instance, our new site, State Street Wire, there are a few models like it around the state, but we sort of feel like if we can make that thing work here, that's an exportable model we can go anywhere with because yeah. this is such a competitive environment that if we can actually gain a foothold here, create a niche for ourselves, maybe we can go elsewhere and, and kind of create a new model in all these state houses, yeah. you know, around the country. Um, and I think that also, you're right, it's a print-heavy print state. You saw, you know, decimation at the Star-Ledger and other, and all the Gannett papers, it's, they're coming back now and the Star-Ledger is restaffing its bureau at the, at the State House. but you really saw a bad time. It was mirrored around the country, but it, it hit, you know, it hit hard here. Um, and in part, I think because a, you had, to, I mean, just the size of the staff and the number of people they put out there to try to try to cover all that happens right. here. So you had a uh, tough times. I mean, it's yeah. it's and it's not over. You still yeah. read about it every yeah. day, and yeah. it's a little scary, you know. Yeah. It, it, uh, but which you know, going to you and I talked about when you had uh, the the gentleman who had covered the yeah. media back in the seventies and eighties. That I think is a huge difference from back then. Is we're all looking over our shoulder these days to yeah. to see you know when the axe is going to fall and and who's next and um, you know the other thing about the media today versus back then I think is there was more competition. I mean there were more reporters then, so right. by virtue of that there were more there was there was extra competition, but you didn't have this race to be first. Yeah. Then, a story like today, the Supreme Court, everybody's going to have it. Yeah. The race then is to get the best little nugget of information, right. get things that no one else had. But everybody's going to have virtually the same story tomorrow morning. Yeah. So, you know, it, that in that sense, there's competition, but it's not the same type of competition that we face, where there's this real charge to get that fast and get it up there. And uh, and uh, I'd like to think while we're not as in-depth and competitive maybe as the 70s and 80s, I'd like to think we're still serving the public in a, you know, in a strong way. Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, competition, even though it's a different type of competition, really makes the quality of everybody's journalism mm -hmm. better. That was one of the observations I had when the Ledger and the Record merged their Statehouse Bureau. Yes, they had more resources, but you know what it's like when you got somebody else who's covering the same story, yeah. you want to do better yeah. than they yeah. do. So, yeah. uh, The other thing, too, is you look at the numbers. Um, I think they said at the time there might have been 40 guys down there, 40, 40 reporters down there covering. And, and one of them uh, made the comment that there aren't half that now. And I, I don't think that's true. We've got, if you think about Bloomberg and us and NJ Spotlight, yeah. you've got 10 reporters just dedicated to online alone, right. never mind all the print guys down there, yeah. which is, you know, while there aren't as many print guys, print reporters, there's a number of straight online. And, you know, and you got... I guess they were always down there, but you got radio as well. And yeah, the Wall Street Journal now has a reporter, right, which Street is something Journal new. So. Yeah, I think like, Press Row is, is you know, fairly full. It's just different people. It, right, it's a, and it's a different dynamic. It's yeah. not you know, 15 daily newspapers all vying for right. the content. So. Okay, well, thank you for Good. sharing your thoughts on, you. on journalism and some thoughts on some breaking news. We'll be sure to follow Politicker to see what happens with that. Great. Okay. Uh, this is Rich Lee from the Hall Institute of Public Policy. My guest has been Daryl Isherwood, the editor of Politicker NJ. Uh, thanks for joining us, and please watch again next time.